Well, welcome everyone to, uh, to this panel, which I think will be really interesting. The gender lens on energy investment. Um, and probably we have some of you here who are here because of the gender side, and we have some of you who are here because of the energy side, and hopefully at the end of the panel, you'll all be satisfied one way or another. Um, but maybe, Jackie, you can start and sort of set the stage for us and talk about what, what an energy lens on, en uh, what a gender lens on energy uh, looks like, what we should be thinking about when we're, we're taking that approach. Sure, Nikki. And I actually sort of like the energy lens on gender. Like, the, <laughs> there could be some fun aspects to that as well. Like it does seem like there's a lot of energy around this conversation right. these days. So, um, many of you have now heard me, and I, um, I have heard people say um, it's only when you're tired of what you're saying that people are actually starting to hear it. Um, so, I will say one more time. Uh, when I think about a uh, gender lens, I mean a lens and not a screen. A lens and not a screen. And I say that because when I have talked to people investing both in, in certain geographies and also in certain sectors like energy, and I say a gender lens, and they say, well, we wouldn't have anything to invest in. Just like, no, 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 this is not about saying, oh, we're going to you know, if it isn't this and this and this, that's out. This is about something that brings opportunities into focus. Again, put your lenses on and you start to see things that you might otherwise miss. Specifically in this case, um, I can let people say, look, pretend you put glasses on and through one eye you are seeing the participation levels, the needs, the experiences and the leadership of women. And through the other side, you were seeing participation level, needs, experiences, and leadership of men. And then start to take a look at where are those the same and where are those different, and how does that relate to how you design your venture and, and so forth. So um, that's what I mean by a lens. And we can go into um, very particular different lenses. I think they'll get called out as we go, but really, a lens is a way to drive new opportunity. Well, I think that's a perfect segue to one of the things that, that Catherine talked about when we were preparing for this panel, we had a conversation, and we were talking about what we each meant by this concept. And, and Catherine, who is the CEO of Solar Sister, which is a company that's based in Uganda and actually a lot of different parts of East Africa that focuses on getting solar into the hands of poor women, using women as, um, as distributors, the Avon lady type of concept. She said it's about, an in, it's about intentionality, the intentionality of, of having women in this space. So tell us what you meant by that, Catherine so that everyone really understands how you do it yourself and how you think it makes a difference and what other people should be doing in a similar way. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Solar Sister is a distribution using women entrepreneurs in rural Uganda um, to bring clean energy technologies to people who are currently living off the grid. They're living, um, lighting their homes with kerosene and we're providing them access to technologies to replace that kerosene with clean energy such as solar. Um, when we looked at our market of who in the household is our customer, we realized it's the women who manage the energy in the household, and so it's the women who are our customers. And therefore, Solar Sister, before it was Solar Sister, when we decided to create a distribution for clean energy technologies, we realized in order to be most effective, we're going to have to reach that woman and really be deliberate about creating an opportunity for her to access, for her to make that decision and, and let demand drive the sales. And in order to do that, we needed to create a, a pathway for her to be comfortable with new technology, for her to find out about it and learn about it. And we will, when we looked at how um, clean energy technologies were currently being distributed, it was often through a small electronic store in a village where um, you, know, you walk in and it's uh, floor to ceiling, electronic gadgety things, and there's a guy standing there at the counter who really doesn't know too much about one or the other. And so if you start asking questions about, you know, I would like some light for my home, and start asking about products, 
he even begins to get defensive. And so it's, it's a very difficult environment for the woman to find out more about the technology, learn about what might work for her. And so we created this women's network of entrepreneurs to, as, as you say, very deliberately focus on the fact that if we're going to reach our customer and our customer is a woman, then we have to have an avenue that works for her. And um, learning about the technology from another woman who can, um, she knows, she trusts, she's going to have a shared experience with and be able to say, I use this technology at home and this is what it's done for me and my family and you can use it also. And so I think being very deliberate about creating that space for women as customers and then also for creating for our entrepreneurs being very deliberate about um, recognizing that they need to have a certain space to learn about the technology themselves and to build this business. Well, that, that sort of segues into the, um, to the, to the area of the product itself. So, you know, what, what are these products that are being sold to the women are, who are they being designed by? And, and Leslie Silverthorne uh, has a company that she's created called Angaza uh, Design, where she's, she's an engineer. Um, so first of all, she's a woman who is an engineer. I mean, that I think, as we learned earlier today, that's a very small, I think, what is it? They're 10% of all the engineers are women. And um, so she's in the product design space and she's in the solar space. I think you must be in a 1% all of your own, <laughs> Leslie. But, but when you're in the business of, of product design, what does it mean to have a gender lens? How do you look at products, the design process differently, the composition of the teams, you know, the way in which you test products? What's, what is, how do you do things differently looking through a gender lens? Yeah, thank you. Um, so through a gender lens with product design, I think one of the key components we have is really making sure that the team designing any specific service or product is really made up of a diverse gender, um, you know, cultural background. And then that's how the great ideas happen. That's how you get, you know, people bringing just a diverse range of thoughts to the table, which actually leads to some of the greatest innovations that have happened. Um, so our design team, not my, my background is in product design engineering, but our design team definitely is a mixture of male and female. Um, and I think it's interesting because, like Catherine said, you know, who's the customer for a lot of these energy products in the market? And it's really the women who are, who are using the products. Um, and I think this is, this is a bit you know, generalizing, but um, in the design space, I think it's the women designers that are really able to take a pretty holistic view of um, the customer and the product. Um, in the human-centered design process, there's a word called empathy. You guys might have really um, heard this word being tossed back and forth, but how I think of empathy is really just the ability to step into your customer's shoes and um, understand their life and understand how they use a product. Um, and it's really important to design the product based on the needs of that user, not, not go in with any assumptions, but just learn hand-in-hand -hand with the user, iterate on the product with the user, um, and then um, just, you know, using this, this term of empathy um, and then coming up with a product or a service based on just understanding your customer. Um, in the energy space, it's understanding how women use the product um, in a lot of cases. Um, so I'll just give you an example. Um, we were just talking to a lot of, of women in uh, northern Tanzania. And in northern Tanzania, the women cook out of separate kitchen huts, which are just um, pretty, pretty simple uh, five-foot round huts at times, they're very small. Um, and they literally spend the majority of their day in these huts cooking. Um, and one of the, the you know, uses of, of solar lights that we were aiming for was women being able to cook with these solar lights where they might have been using kerosene lanterns before. Um, and so it was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, they'll bring these solar lights and, um, into their kitchen huts and cook with them. And the women refused. They said, no, this, the solar light is a product that you know, we paid a lot of money for, we value. There's no way I'm bringing it in the, the dirty kitchen hut to cook by it. So this, this whole aspect of how we thought that you know, women might use the product um, was completely shattered. And, and this is one you know, example of empathy that we really shouldn't have and, and um, ended up not imposing our own thoughts on, on how the, they would use the product. Um, and one more thought on that, so a good designer, not only are they engineering a product or a service, but they're also thinking about how that product or service sells or is marketed to the customer. Um, and what I've seen a lot of times is that 
Uh, oftentimes it's the men who, the, the man of the household who's making the ultimate purchasing decision, but it's oftentimes the woman in the household who's using the product. So how can you sort of you know, appeal to, to the women in the household to sort of influence the man to ultimately make that purchasing decision? Um, and we're even seeing that one step further because um, we're a solar pay-as-you-go company, meaning uh, it's not only the upfront purchase decision of a product, but they're also purchasing energy as often as a week at a time. Um, so it's also the purchasing decision of that energy chunk. And so we're just starting to get all this data back about you know, how, how is the women influencing the man to make that purchasing decision, and you know, is it a guilt trip about the child being able to study at night? Or, um, so, so it's just thinking about the whole marketing of a product as well. Well, Ajaita Shah from Frontier Markets has a distribution company where she's actually spent a lot of time thinking about a number of these issues, marketing to women and perceptions that men and women might have of products. I remember one story that you told me about a particular light in India where it was just not selling and it wasn't a success and it was because the men thought it was too feminine, which I thought was fascinating. So if you can, you know, tell us some more, give us some more examples about these kinds of gendered visions of products. Right, sure. Um, so I think one of the f uh, fun things for me with Frontier Markets is that we spend time with just households, getting to know them in and out, uh, because we always are trying to bring in new basket of products that would make sense for these households. So it's not just a solar lantern, but it might be you know, a fox light torch, it might be a Pico home lighting system, it might be a solar inverter system. And so every time you're thinking about bringing these new products in, you're constantly thinking about who that household individual is, what their different roles are, and how are they then thinking about the everyday use of these products, right? So, um, you know, a, a couple of examples, but, um, you know, a fox light, so a, a, a high beam fox light solar light is a focus light. And this is a light that was demanded by all of our farmers. And um, all of the farmers happen to be all men. And, um, and it wasn't that female weren't, fem females weren't going into uh, the field to do farm work, it's just that culturally, they would leave way before the sunset. So um, that's the reason for why men were out there longer. And so when, when, when men were out there longer, they required that high beam fox light torch. And so that torch was a quick seller for every farmer, male farmer that was in our, in, our, in our market because they understood that product, they identified with it, and they knew the use immediately. Um, when we talk about, so the irony is that when we actually talk about the solar lantern, um, we actually do talk about it for during cooking. But when we discuss it with women, women, the, you have to discuss their frustration. So their frustration for women is it's so annoying to have to keep, you know, a candle next to your stove and constantly have to get up to light a new candle because you have no sense of lighting. And it takes a lot longer, it's harder to see, and you'll definitely not keep a kerosene lantern next to you because you might burn yourself. So that's when they're saying, oh wow, I can keep a light on top of my, um, on top of my kitchen, that would be perfect. So I'm gonna keep it on top so it doesn't get near the mess. So you hang the solar lantern versus keeping it right next to you. Um, a lot of things about talking to women about independence, um, so freedom from having to go and charge their cell phones all the time by going to men, for, going to retail shops. So this is another really interesting story. But the, a lot of women don't own their cell phones, right? It's usually it's usually their husband's cell phone. But once in a while, they get the chance to keep the cell phone, and they're so excited to like use that cell phone as much as possible because that's like the one day that they get it. So when they've dis discharged that cell phone because they've used it the entire day, they, f they really get scared that they're getting in trouble because their husband's coming back and being like, why is my phone completely discharged? So they run to the retail shop and because they don't have access to electricity, so they run to the retail shop and they beg the retail guy to charge the phone for them. And they'll pay him double the price to charge the phone because there's that sense of urgency. So women have been actually wanting a solar mobile phone charger for themselves a lot more than the men have. And it's a, such an interesting concept when you think about the role and what happens in terms of the day to day. Um, in Rajasthan specifically, it's very different than the South, right? I mean, Rajasthan's super conservative. And so you have to understand how you're supposed to be communicating to these women, when you're supposed to be communicating to these women, and what's gonna be the different responses based on who's around, right? So we were talking about this earlier, but 
you know, if there are men around and you're trying to do a focus group about these products, you're not going to get the women to respond. But the second you get the men out of the room, these women, you know, kind of take off their, you know, uh, their, their, their sari covers and they essentially um, start really communicating with you and telling you about what they want and how they feel. So, you know, I think that this is something that we look at and products, marketing and sales, like, you know, like Leslie was saying, all the time. And it's really exciting to see that you can't just identify women or men as women and men, but you have to identify them as mothers, as sisters, as daughters, as daughter-in-laws, and what that role plays, you know? Um, and, and, and also how that then interacts with like the male dynamic as well. And so that's where product creation becomes really interesting. Well, uh, to segue to Aneri, and Aneri Patel is with the UN year, with, with the United, <laughs> now I'm, I'm actually messing up my segue to you, is with the United Nations Foundation. And this is the UN Year of Sustainable Energy. And the UN Foundation has done um, an amazing job of promoting access to clean energy. And in the course of that, you and Richenda Van Leeuwen, who's leading this, felt very strongly that there should be a gender component and that we should really be thinking about um, the, the gender lens to, for en clean energy in the context of the year. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the impetus for that and some of the initiatives that the UN year has, um, has sort of promoted uh, around this, this area of gender and energy. Sure, so um, the UN Foundation has the Energy Access Practitioner Network, which is a global network of over 600 organizations and companies that work in this space. So we have a pretty good eagle eye view over the sector based on the data we get from different practitioners all around the world. And what you would see in that, that database is if 10% of engineers in the United States are women, how men, what percentage of engineers in India are women? Mm -hmm. So it's a very male driven space, but at the same time, 1.3 billion people in this world need access to electricity and a little over half of that are women. So it's really important to take, into, uh, to take note um, in terms of investing in energy to have a gender lens. As Jackie so eloquently put in the plenary session yesterday, that investing in women actually needs a higher return. And with the 1.3 billion um, person market, that's a huge opportunity for, for social enterprise and business and uh, in, in new financial markets. So um, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, rather than focusing specifically on gender as a method of um, increasing energy access, it's a very cross-cutting issue. Mm -hmm. We have to look at gender and all, all, all the silos of energy, energy in agriculture, because most farmers in the world right. are, are women, uh, energy in health, because um, many hospitals don't have um, access to energy, and women who are giving childbirth are doing it at night, and it's extremely dangerous, and is creating all kinds of um, health issues for women. Um, and energy with microgrids, because uh, using a, including women in that model for the villages to bring power. So there's so many different aspects of energy access that needs to include the gender component. And that's why it's so important to look at it through a lens and not as a screen, as Jackie stated. Well, Jackie, you, you are our expert on, on all of these, these, these issues. And maybe bring us an investor perspective. You, you've convened investors. You know, you, you know the way in, in, investors think. In this particular space, in terms of energy, um, what, what do you think investors should be thinking at? You know, th particularly this issue of higher returns. I, I should say, I was chatting to an investor who happens to be a man earlier, and I was telling him about this panel. Um, he's actually on a panel right now himself. He said to me, I really am bummed that I can't be there to listen because you know, I was just chatting to Ross of Village Capital, and he was telling me they did an analysis of their portfolio, and the companies that are run by women are just doing, what was it, 12% better? So give us some statistics as to why this makes, this is not just something you should do from your heart. It should be <laughs> something you should do because it will actually make a difference to your pocketbook. Yeah, so a, a couple different things. So one, I just want to say that I am in the company of esteemed experts here um, and, and honored to be there, be here. Um, and Richenda actually last year said to me as I was talking about 
gender lens investing. She said, Jackie, I believe there will be more gender lens investing when there are more women doing the investing. Mm -hmm. Which was very interesting and, and put me again in this model of saying, how do we get more women angels? How do we empower more women philanthropists to start to feel like they can actually move money in this space? Um, what's happening there? So short story on that. Um, at SOCAP in Amsterdam last year, there was a wonderful angel network kind of practitioner mini session, and, and it was a solar company. And so little pitch, and then how would angels talk to this company? And um, it was a wonderful thing, Suzanne Beagle, God bless her, stood up and said, so I'd like to understand the gender diversity of your board. Mm -hmm. For this solar company, that was, you know, talking about how they were going to bring lighting to women. And uh, the wonderful, brilliant entrepreneur said, well, um, our board is all men. And, and then he said, nobody's ever asked that before. <laughs> and and it, so this is the, the aspect that you sort of go, okay, part of this for investors is starting to ask questions in, in, an, in an inquiry sort of way. Really, no one's ever asked that before. Maybe we should start thinking about these things, just both because gender diverse boards make stronger companies and also because in a space where gender diversity and especially women are such a huge part of creating impact, how could you, how can you not, right? And then that also goes from there through to the leadership of a company and what's happening not just with the CEO, although I will say here you've got to look and say how is it that we are not completely supporting the women CEOs in this space, like how could we not? But um, also, throughout the whole ranks of the company, what's happening, how is it that there's a diverse workforce and, and so forth. Um, I'll say I was talking with Kristen Hull, who some of you may have seen yesterday up here, and she had a wonderful perspective on this that I think more investors will start to come. She said, Jackie, my um, passions are around sustainability mm -hmm. and around social justice. My strategy is around women. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting reframe for me, you know, that you could, because I do have investors say to me, well, I'm, I'm about the environment, I'm not about women. And so this reframe of like, no, actually, you can't be about sustainability in a way that's actually going to work without also being about at least a gender lens, and I would posit about women. Yeah, uh, I'm, my company um, is very focused on the financing side. How do we finance clean energy and water for end users, um, many of whom are women? And quite honestly, we really have the women who are in the space here. There aren't, there, there aren't a huge number of other companies led by women out there, um, and these, of course, are delicious, I mean, amazing, <laughs> fantastic women. But I would like to see more. I want to see more women running companies who really have this focus and, and more companies run by men that have a gender lens, you know, because many of their clients are women. So I would love to find a way for us collectively to support these kinds of initiatives. And just maybe, maybe what we should do is open up the the room to questions or comments from people um, on, on all of the things that you've heard, and particularly on ideas um, about how we can make this a more gender-friendly space. Can I just say one thing before sure. we start? Um, I think one of the reasons for why we've also, though, as women CEOs or, you know, like leaders and in, in, in looking at the energy space have been successful is because one of the things that all of us have been doing a lot more, and we were just talking about this earlier, was that we're collaborating a lot more. You know, we're creating a lot more um, networks and being more transparent about our work. I mean, you know, Solar Sister and Frontier Markets have been tweeting with each other for like, I think a, almost a year now about, you know, what we're doing, because we're doing very similar work, but in different if, in different countries. You know, when Angaza Design first came out with the product, the first thing I did was start giving you design feedback for my customers, you know? And it's like, I think that collaboration is something that we've been doing a a lot more as women 
um, in this space. And I've definitely noticed that, you know, building and getting stronger in the last couple of like years because, you know, when when women for whatever reason work together, we're not sitting here going, oh, you're competition or this is going to be, you know, this is information that's we need to sign an NDA for. Like, you know, we're very a lot more open and transparent to discuss that. And then on the investment side, we have folks like you um, that are actually taking this point to say that, you know, what, even if I can't invest in you, I will find someone else that can invest in you. And I think that's really important to kind of point out. Yeah. Well, does anyone have um, a comment or a question? I can hardly see you, actually. <laughs> Are there any? I can't. There is a hand over there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, no, I, I, I think it's very interesting when you're pointing out that when you bring up uh, the, the idea of gender uh, to people, like you asked the composition of a board to see how many females were on the board, and somebody sort of stepped back and was shocked by it and thought, well, you know, gee, it's all men, and you're right. Our, especially when we're looking at, at energy access in the developing world, where indeed, as you point out, most of your customers are women. Did you, were you, did you receive pushback on the idea of, of, of adding more women to the board? I mean, because everything you're saying, even though I'm a male, I, I totally resonate with the need to balance out our approach, if for no other reason for expediency, given the market that we're trying to, to, uh, to access, that we need the perspective of women to help balance out our approach. When you finally sort of alert people to this new gender lens and the need for balance, do you, do you get pushback from from folks, from from men probably more more than that? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll put two sides to that. Um, on the one hand, uh, no, people will say yes, we really do want to find women for our board, um, and we can't find any. And and then there is the question of both. Um, you know, how many people have you asked, and what, what do you think actually qualifies a board member? Right. Right, because it's a really fascinating thing to say, what if you're working in energy in developing markets, what's a powerful board? Is it a whole bunch of people who've been CEOs right. before, or is it a, a combination of different skill sets? Should you have someone who's been in product design? Should you have someone who understands, you know, that there's a, aspect there. Um, so, um, no, I think that, that people in general um, do embrace this question of a gender lens, but then there's just um, the practicality of it and, and the fact that you actually have to be deliberate and um, focused. The other thing I'll bring up, and I'd love to sort of uh, ask the, the panelists, is um, on the metric side of things, uh, I think that investors need to be asking more questions on, on metrics and you know how mm -hmm. gender differentiated data, um, and that's hard for entrepreneurs on the one hand because it's more pressure. On the other hand, it really does demonstrate you know what what's happening and so forth. So, that's... I have I have one anecdote from my previous life. I worked in an organization called Women's World Banking, which has spent a lot of time thinking about this issue and. What we would do is we had, we had a very broad network. Some of the organizations were led by, by women, the core network, affiliate network. And then we had a number of organizations that were led by men, but that were leaders in the field of microfinance. And what we did was we published data on a number of different things, you know, the number of clients they had, the percentage of women. And we published data on, uh, on the governance structure, how many men uh, and the, uh, how many women there were on the board, what percentage of the board was women, uh, what percentage of the staff were women. And I remember very early on a leading MFI, I mean it was one of the biggest MFIs, said to me, because I was one of the people who was making sure this data got out there, said to me, well Nikki, you know, do we have to have the, the board, because they were doing really well on all the stats except for the board composition of women you know, where it was, I think it was like 3%. I think they had, you know, they had a quite a large board and there was one woman, or they had no, no women maybe. 
And I said, yeah, you know, that's part of what we, we promote as Women's World Bank. Can't we just leave that out? Do we, have to, can't, do, we ha can't, do we have to have that? And within two years, that organization had, was up to 30%. So it was, it was just even making it visible, which was, I think, to your point, Catherine, you know, having just making it part of the conversation starts to shift behavior. There was no penalty. You weren't going to be thrown out or anything like that. But, you know, people are competitive. I want to be competitive on the number of clients I have, and if this is another way in which I'm rated, I want to be competitive on the number of women I have on my board. But I think the thing that is most persuasive is if at the end of the day, you know, true to all the data that you've shown, Jackie, um, businesses are more profitable if they have diverse boards, diverse staff, if they have, you know, if they have a woman-centered, a, a woman-cognizant, woman-centered approach, that you don't really need to have more of a conversation than that if, it's, if, if that's what people care about. But to your point on metrics, I mean, I think that it's, it's not about whether we should be forced to look at you know, women metrics versus male metrics. It's just that there's, there's got to be, to me, it's always been about a business sense, right? And so when I'm looking at, um, you know, what, what has been the trend of uh, women female pur purchases, it's important to understand that based mm -hmm. on what my actual value add as a business is, because if I don't understand 50% of my market, then I'm not going to exactly. be a successful business. But then also to track that impact, because the use is different. Like, you know, the amount of kerosene being used by a woman versus a man, depending on what she's using it for versus what he's using it for, makes me have to measure impact metrics differently based on gender because mm -hmm. of that reason. Um, and also generally thinking about um, even the purpose of a board, it's not that it should be that, oh, you have to have women on your board, but it's you understand the value add of having right. certain types of personalities or certain types of functionalities on your board, which actually makes you a much more you know, successful company as a whole, right? And I think that's kind of the direction that it should be going into. We have a question here. Yeah, I have a follow-on question right into that. Um, I guess um, in the US and other Western countries, like women have that purchasing power and that say in, um, in the finances to back up the, the economics of it. Can you talk a little bit about each of your markets and how that dynamic plays out um, when they don't, might not have the same amount of financial power in, in the household? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about in our market is in East Africa and Uganda specifically. And um, I think most people assume that all financial decisions are made by the men in the household. But it's not really true, because what we're talking about are capital expenditures probably are. And when you're talking about installing a large home system or making a big capital expenditure, it's, it's going to be made you know, certainly as a family and most often by the man. But when we're talking about daily purchases, and, and that's really what we're talking about in at the level of what we're doing is we're you know, selling um, small solar lamps that are replacing the purchase of kerosene. And that is something that the woman manages. She manages her household budget. And even if she has to go to the man to get approval for making a larger expenditure, she's going to have to be the one who initiates that. Um, the husband is not going to sit back and think about, oh, wouldn't it be great for my wife to have this cleaner light? You know, she's got to be the one who goes to him and kind of points out, you know, I use this smoky light every day. It's, you know, I'm coughing. Our children aren't studying. You know, we could improve our family life with this new technology. And so I think it's, it's both women do have more purchase power than people realize, and they have more um, purchase influence, certainly, than people realize. I think one thing to add on that too, um, it's really been surprising each time I go out into the market and talk with customers and I'm just absolutely delighted by the fact that I think gender roles are really just getting flipped on their head. Um, you know, I see men all the time, maybe their, their wife has died um, and they're really, you know, taking care of maybe five children and they're taking on such a traditional <laughs> women's role um, by just putting priority to education, um, making sure they can replace kerosene with a solar light to so their children aren't inhaling toxic fumes and they can study. Um, and then I see women who, um, particularly in the, the um, with our pay-as-you-go system, the women are stepping up and actually helping their neighbors top up their lights and add energy to their lights each week. And 
um, you know, that, that kind of initiative, that kind of independence to just, you know, help the village um, make these, these weekly purchasing decisions too. It, I just see the, the traditional gender roles not really holding up many times. So. So I don't know if that's necessarily true for India. Um, I think it depends on what part of the country you're in. So if you're in the north, um, there are a lot of really traditional gender roles that exist. Um, you know, women aren't really making the purchasing decisions for most things um, there because the men tend to really take on that um, I'm responsible for the home, I'm responsible for the income, and so I get to make the decisions. Um, but um, the men in, in, in that space are a lot more sensitive to their responsibility of being a good husband and being a good father. So you talk about, you know, having your wife be more comfortable or having your children, you know, get educated and they actually are more susceptible to that. Um, whereas in the South, it's the exact opposite. I mean, um, men are really, we, could, we used to call them um, male, a male dud syndrome because they literally were just not involved in anything responsible. And so women took on that role of really taking on the leadership role of that house. And so she was actually the more active, aggressive one making most of the purchasing decisions. So she was involved in that. Um, and then if they don't have purchasing power, if they don't have enough money, what I've noticed, and I think it goes along to what you're talking about in terms of helping top ups, but like we found this that women tend to help each other out more uh, t to cover the cost of a light, or they might buy it in group, they might do like some sort of group purchasing dynamics. Like we started doing a lot more interesting financial modeling based on the dynamics of women. Yes. Yeah, thanks very much um, for a, a great panel and a great theme and great phrase, gender lens. I work with the World Food Program. We talk about enhanced commitments to women, but gender lens is a much easier way of saying it, so thanks. Um, your last comments are just starting to get at my question. We, in the, the energy area that you're looking at right now, have been looking at women in agriculture and aware of just simple things like so many of our beneficiaries are women who are farmers who spend inordinate amount of time pounding out grain. And so we look at things like grinders for the home so that we're reducing the amount of time they're doing it. Um, we're looking at the role that they're playing in the agricultural production itself. In both of these areas and in, in many others, we're recognizing that, we're, we're not sure if we're recognizing, we're starting to think about well, instead of having a, a grinder in every home, wouldn't it be smarter to have an entrepreneur in the, biz, in the village and, 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 and people go there? Or um, rather than having you know, individual family tractors and so on, some, some other sort of more public works or publicly owned kind of scheme to address the, these energy challenges. I wonder, the examples that you've all cited in your business seem to be household-oriented gender lens. And I'm wondering if there's a change in gender lens when you think about something which is just a little bit up the scale, which is not household level, it's more community level, village or level approaches to energy solutions and how to look at those through a gender lens. One of the things that we see is at the community level, there is a, a really strong tradition of women's community groups and that they are such a natural resource to tap into for distribution of the types of activities you're talking about. Um, they do work together beautifully. We see them um, come together and form these savings and loans groups and purchase, kind of collectively purchase power groups so that they can provide um, you know, service products for their entire group, and it's, it's a very efficient and beautiful way for them to access really financing at, a, at the most low, low cost way because they're not charging each other interest. And um, there's this incredible sense of community support that I think, you, you know, would be very appropriate for tapping into for the, for the type of activities you're talking about. Um, just a there's, there's so I think the reason why we're talking more about household and not I guess on community level because there's also this sense of ownership that exists in terms of 
the products that we're talking about in terms of the energy space, right? There's there's personal utility, but then there's also commercial utility. utility. And I think that um, in, in Rajasthan specifically, um, I've actually been challenging this notion of using community models because um, generally utility has been something that people have not liked because there's it's it's not been um, uh, reliable, right? So access to electricity has not been reliable. And so I tend to always hear people telling me about how they want to be free of this ongoing commitment. And they just want to have independence and have ownership. And so that to me has become a little difficult to understand that on a community level play. Um, and generally speaking, um, people will come together to insist on you know the local government getting street lights but they won't pitch in for that. Um, so I'm, I'm, and, and we've seen a lot of sun charging stations come, come in, like come in. This, these were government initiatives where there were these sun charging stations that technically everyone would then bring their products to and charge, but they haven't been successful. So I'm, I'm finding it actually hard to even, not even on a, on a gender perspective, on a community perspective, just trying to understand why it's not working, at least where I'm operating. Well, I think, I think there are, situations where it doesn't work and situations where it works, where my organization happens to work in Afghanistan, which okay. is, you know, from a gender lens perspective, I think the lens is very tricky there. <laughs> um, but there are traditional financing mechanisms that have existed since Alexander the Great's time where the community will pay the things it wants. So, for example, fixing the mosque or paying the mullah's salary. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes paying for uh, the school that needs to be something that has to, something to do with the school, paying for generators. So they'll pay for generators. They'll pay sometimes to keep the wells functioning, to fix something with the wells. But it's really, it's very unpredictable what they will choose to pay for. And what they choose to pay for has everything to do with the way the Shura system works and the way in which the community is motivated. And inevitably, the things that will get paid for are the things everyone can agree on, like the mosque and the mullah's salary. You know, and, and one of the interesting things in talking to villagers there, we were able to do focus groups actually with women and men. The women who were widows, whose husbands who had been Mohajuddin fighters and who, were, who didn't have power in the shura, complained that their viewpoint was not being embraced enough by the shura and that they had to fight very hard to get their perspective um, listened to and that they were, you know, they were sort of marginalized, which is not surprising. But some of them were actually very persistent and very, very, how can I say, persuasive, and they were able to have things that they cared for um, shifted, like for example, fixing the well outside their house, which was for a small group of people, was was paid for by by a local shura member. So I think it I think it, it's different in different contexts. In some places, um, the kinds of things that you're talking about are funded, and women are are at least the beneficiaries of it. If they're if you know, often they're pushing for it, and sometimes it takes a long time for that viewpoint. To, to actually be, um, be advanced and sort of implemented in a way that, that's meaningful. Um, any other questions? I oh, yeah. Add to that as well, that, um, the energy access space tends to look at women as beneficiaries of energy, but we really have to stress gender along with the entire supply chain. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about you know, involving the community, a, a large part of it is having that community buy-in. and targeting those influential leaders, which typically tend to be men, but what about the influential women in the communities? Exactly. Why not be deliberate and look at those? Because there are definitely socialites in, in villages that have a lot of power, just like the, the men in the village do. So just being deliberate along on, on the entire supply chain of, of the system. And to your point, the wife of the mullah is a very powerful person, even in a place like Afghanistan. Um, do we have other questions? Also, in addition to along the entire supply chain, bringing it back to um, women on the investment side, making sure that we are um, women aren't just beneficiaries and they're not just supply chain, but they are also owners and investments. Mm -hmm. And right. you know, we we invest really in women entrepreneurs at a, at a very grassroots level. But then when I look at that sort of pull back and say, well, you know, we want those women 
entrepreneurs to grow, not just to be small, little, cute entrepreneurs, but to grow up to be businesses. And we want those businesses to attract capital and um, to take a look at why should somebody invest in a woman business, a woman-owned business at that level, a small or medium-sized business, does it matter at all that she's a woman? And I think it still does. I think in order mm -hmm. to, um, to get the kind of engagement throughout society of women as, um, as you know, beneficiaries, as entrepreneurs, and as business owners, as in investors, you know, we, we need to very, very um, deliberately and intentionally encourage all of that, all of that activity. Well, and, and I mean, I'm sorry, I, I initiated the word beneficiary. I take it completely back. <laughs> women in Afghanistan, unfortunately, it ends up being like that. But women as customers, as consumers, you know, as active participants in as much as it makes as we need to be moving in that direction, right. even in some of these very challenging contexts. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we had a question over here. Um, it, it sounds like it, I totally understand the importance of having women as leaders of these organizations, especially when females are and have a lot of purchasing power. I'm curious how in each of your organizations you prevent the lens from becoming too much of a screen. Um, to your point earlier, have you ever struggled with making sure that um, you have a diverse board that has you know, both male empathy? We, we do have uh, both male and female board, and um, we even have um, males working with Solar Sister, we have Solar Brothers, and um, <laughs> some of our entrepreneurs as well. But I think it, it still our, our primary motivation is to, um, to make sure that women are having that space to participate in the energy sector at, at a very um, real and hands-on way. Um, we have a mixed board, uh, and a lot of our field staff actually are men, um, and a lot of our franchisees are also men, um, because they are actually there's a brick and mortar shop that they're managing. For us, it's not been about making sure they're all men or all women. It's mm -hmm. about understanding the dynamic that plays between the male and the women. So, like a lot of our franchisees' wives are the influencers, and they're like throwing these parties in their homes, and they're actually creating. They're creating um, a, another income generating activity because we realize in our space, women tend to do a much better job marketing and gathering and not selling specifically. Um, so I think, and then even our field staff, um, the men field staff are there because they can stay at night later to do light demos because at night, that's when you can actually see the efforts of your solar lights. Women, for um, in, in our situation, it's not safe. So they, the outside women cannot stay running around in villages and trying to manage franchisees. And so it's just about being sensitive as to what the role is, what the capacity mm -hmm. is, and what the dynamic is. Um, and that's how we kind of look at gender lens and prevent it from being a screen. Leslie? Yeah, I mean, I think we actually, um, I wish we looked at everything through a gender lens more often. Um, we have more male investors. We have more male mentors and advisors. Um, and, you know, I, I wish it were a bit more balanced. Um, traditionally, we're not a, a company that is, you know, marketing specifically to women, selling specifically to women. Um, you know, we're a pay-as-you-go technology development company. Um, and oftentimes, you know, the majority of the people we want to hire are men because they're the engineers that we're reaching out to to, to get that talent. Um, you know, great if we can find the 10% women engineers out there, but um, it's not a reality all the time. So I think it's, it's definitely not a screen for us. It's, it's something we're just trying to balance out every day. And, and for me, my, my organization has women and men on the board, women and men who are staff, women and male-led organizations we invest in. One of the things that we try to do is, in our investments, make sure that we are capturing gender data in a way that's meaningful. So looking at the impact on women, trying to see whether the companies, if the companies, you know, to the question that you were raising earlier, if the companies aren't naturally seeing that there may be a differential impact on men and women, having some of those conversations. So we're trying to be very even-handed, uh, and I would love to have 
panels where I'm not the only woman on the panel. This is such a fantastic panel to be on because I'm the only woman they can roll out in the gender space, uh, gender sort of whatever in the energy space relating to, to gender. So I think we need more companies that do have an overtly woman-centered uh, perspective given all of that evenness that I was talking about earlier. Um, other questions or comments? Yes? This is a relatively new way of looking at things. The one thing I'm familiar with is Barefoot College. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could comment on what you know about it, whether it's a really leading edge model or is it have problems? There, there are a number of organizations, particularly in Southeast Asia, that have really looked at women as sort of as entrepreneurs and sort of as part of the distribution system, which is what the Barefoot College does. You know, another example that stands out in the energy space is Grameen Shakti, where um, all of the install, or all of I think all of the installers actually and the technicians are women. So this is, so if we, if we think about you as, I don't know whether they would even think about themselves as engineers, but arguably they're in that engineering space. And this is really very, very many women who are, who are building businesses and who are providing service and maintenance, which is key for Grameen Shakti in having their model work. So I think it's a, I think it's a very important perspective. Uh, Deep, Deepal Barua, who is the person who started um, Grameen Shakti has um, started an organization called the Bright Green Energy Foundation where it's specifically about creating um, opportunities for women as solar entrepreneurs. He, he sees, he wants to have, I think he has a very large, 100 million, he wanted to have 100 million solar systems in Bangladesh um, run by and maintained by women, uh, which would be fantastic. So, you know, those kinds of models, I think, are really interesting models. I don't know if anyone... So I, think, I think the real genius of what Barefoot College did was they looked at what, what is it that... Um, they removed a barrier that allowed women to participate, and that barrier was that, they, that you have to be literate in order to right. go on to this engineering school. And they said, you don't need to be literate. Engineering is, you know, the engineering that they're teaching is all hands-on kind of stuff. So by removing that barrier of literacy, and saying we can take these women on even if they are illiterate. It opened up the door for a lot of women to be able to participate in something that had traditionally been male. And I see that in the same ways. If you look at um, being a shopkeeper, often being a shopkeeper, owning a store, keeping it open late at night, um, and thinking that that is the only way you can distribute products is through shops, that means that somebody has to go and be at the shop from early in the morning to late at night. Well, that by itself pretty much precludes women from being participants because women have children at home. They have husbands to cook for. They have so many other family responsibilities that are not going to be lifted from their shoulders. And so thinking that the only way you can distribute, the only way you can participate in this market is by becoming a shopkeeper means you are excluding women. And you're not even thinking you're doing it, but you're excluding women. And so if you take a look at some of those um, sort of unconscious barriers that get put up for women's participation and remove those obstacles, and then it opens up the way for women to participate. And I really think that, that that's what Barefoot College did so brilliantly, is removing that obstacle, and then it just opened up the way for women to participate. And to add on with the Grameen Shakti business model, it's, I know it's different from Barefoot College, but um, one of the brilliant business pieces of that is that a rural Bangladeshi woman at home, it's unacceptable for her to open the door to let a male technician install a solar home system on top of her house. So training women solar electricians um, overcomes that obstacle and then allows for easier installations and then increases the business. So it makes business sense, back to your point. I just You're going to make love profit that. on that I love that. I will be using that story. <laughs> I think the key just is to understand your landscape, understand the kind of women, what motivates them, and then really try to figure out how that fits into your model, right? I mean, it worked in Thelonia really well, but like, I mean, they haven't been able to scale that throughout Rajasthan for other reasons, right? But in the South, there are a lot of models like that that work really well. So it's really about just trying to understand what works where well and, and, then, and then implement that, so. And it comes back to what, what Catherine was saying earlier. 
it's, it's an intent, it's intentionality. There's an intentional aspect to this, which I think for me is very powerful and very successful at the end of the day. Um, do we, have we run out of time? The clock is very interesting here. It's moving forward and backwards. I feel like we're, we're, we're sort of time traveling, but let's pretend. I mean, it's giving us a couple of extra minutes. If anyone has any more questions, um, I can't see if there are any others here. Yes. Yes, exactly. This is so exciting. It, don't you love that? We're getting extra time on gender, which is so fantastic. Within energy and, and beyond, I'm wondering if you could speak to intergenerational dynamics or trends that you're seeing um, with the gender lens. I'd love to start on that. It's actually really exciting. So um, I think that uh, so, so there's a role that the mother-in-law plays, which is so interesting to me, versus the role that the daughter plays versus the daughter-in-law versus like the, the, the five-year-old, the, the seven-year-old daughter, okay? And, and, and it's, 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 it's all different layers of excitement. So a mother-in-law, what I'm seeing is if she likes the products and she understands solar, she kind of gives her bindiri, which is her daughter-in-law, like the signal because she's had some education to go and start helping her husband. And that's really revolutionary to like see a Rajasthani woman, like mother-in-law, a Rajasthani mother-in-law saying yes to let her daughter in a rural village go out and start working. Um, we're also seeing a lot more excitement on the younger generation side. So these girls that are like 15, 16 years old um, and can't go to school anymore, um, but they're at home. They're like, they're getting frustrated and they're seeing this movement in, the, in, in rural villages and they're saying, we want to step up. You know, we want to get involved. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of the children that are getting educated are again getting excited to get access to solar because it's giving them an opportunity to learn more. So they're forcing their parents to come and listen to marketing activities. So you're seeing a lot more interesting involvement in terms of the different roles and the different types of mentalities that you're seeing um, in energy or in, in what we're trying to do on the ground. And, uh, and I think that it's interesting to see the different um, age groups that actually then get involved in that. I think your question is interesting, even from, from the perspectives of each of us individually. Um, Energy is an aspirational thing. If you don't have it, you want it for yourselves, you want it for your children, you want it for your grandchildren. And, you know, I think about my grandmother who had, she's Italian, was Italian, she had seven children. And during World War II, she washed the clothes of all of those children by hand in northern Italy because that's what you had to do. And, you know, when she got a washing machine, her life changed. She could do all sorts of things. It takes a lot of time to wash the clothes of seven children. And so we're seeing that kind of, and many of us, I think, had grandmothers and great-grandmothers who were doing a similar thing. Their lives were occupied doing these kinds of menial tasks that not having access to energy um, kind of captured them in. Now, those shifts that happened to our foremothers are happening in the developing world through access to energy. And I think, I think we should all remember we're not that far away. You know, for me, I can actually remember my grandmother telling me those stories. That's just, that's, you know, two generations away. Um, and I'm sure many of you have similar kinds of stories, even in your own families. Um, also, I, I think it's interesting to note, too, that I, I think a current statistic from ILO is that 75% of Africa is under the age of 25. And if we're going to meet the 2030 goal of energy access for all, all of the young people today in Africa will technically have electricity by the time they reach adulthood. So it's really important, too, to think about the demographic kind of changes that will occur. Um, will those younger people start having less children? Are they going to live longer because of access to health care? And all these different things that feed in from access to energy. So that, I love that question because it pulls into, it pulls, makes energy a bigger development. Um, question. Yeah, and, and I'll share one anecdote, which is um, we, in training our entrepreneurs, we had a, a training session and all the, you know, the ladies came and they got the training and we go back a month later and, and do the follow up and um, one of the women stepped up and she was an older woman and her name's Frances and she said, you know, when I came to this training and I looked around and I saw all these young ladies and I thought, oh, you know, this is a business this is a business for young ladies. You know, I can't do this because I'm a grandmother. And she said, but I gave it a try, and I, I took, you know, the systems, and I, and I actually sold some. And I was 
earned some money and I was quite, you know, she was actually quite successful. And she said, and, and now I know that this is a business that even grandmothers can do. And she stood up and she was so proud and it was really, I, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I think one comment on the training aspect too, which we've seen, which I've loved is um, the, so we have a mobile money component of just adding energy to a light. The, the family has to send a mobile money payment. And oftentimes it's the children, when I say children, I mean like, um, you know, 10 to 20 years old, um, using, who have used mobile money in the past. So the parents um, are just immediately handing the product to the child and just saying, you know, I'm designating you as the person in the household to add energy. Um, you know, whether it's a, a female child or a male child, it's, it's the, the youth that really just catch on like that. Um, so if we want to train people really quickly, we find the 10 to 20 year old within the household. <laughs> So my, my perspective on this came more from the investor side of things where I will say um, we, I'm very encouraged with the next generation um, asking questions about where their investments are going. And so you're seeing a lot of that in sustainable investing in general, but the next gen um, family members saying, I don't want to be part of the foundation unless I start to get to have some control and I start to get to, you know, say where the investment's going. And then you, you know, cross that with their interest in sustainability and then see previous conversation about you can't be interested in sustainability without being interested in gender lens and it all comes out quite nicely. Well, I think, I think the clock has actually run out on us. Is that right? <laughs> I don't think we can claim any more minutes from the clock. So on that lovely note, Thanks to all of you for being fantastic. And all of you who are investors, you should be investing in these lovely ladies um, because they're all running fantastic businesses. And, uh, and for those of you who are entrepreneurs in this space, come and let us know because we need more of you um, to be able to support um, in the future. So thanks to all of you for being here.